Hello, my name is James R. Morgan III, and I'm happy to be here with you today for the annual conference of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. And I'm also honored to be presenting to you today, in part because this is my first time presenting before this wonderful organization as a full-fledged member. I hope you all are enjoying your summer as we begin to get ready to celebrate Juneteenth. And I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, enjoy, to view my presentation about my ancestor, Joseph McBride, uh, my family's first Prince Hall Freemason. Now, when I use that term, Prince Hall Freemason, some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you will be more familiar and maybe do some more research and find some people in your own family lines who had membership in this wonderful organization. Prince Hall, was not a place. Prince Hall was a person, a very important man of African descent who lived in and around the Boston, Massachusetts area during the American Revolutionary War period. Scholars believe that he was born somewhere around 1735, and we know based upon documentation that he passed from this life in December of 1807. Prince Hall's life is one that for some may be seen as obscure, but was in fact very imp impactful on the history and direction of the African-American community right down to today. Prince Hall uh, was an educator, an orator, a caterer, and a leather dresser in his, uh, in his profession uh, and did other uh, odd jobs and whatnot uh, to make ends meet for himself and his family. Some say that Prince Hall may have even uh, served in the military, although there's conflicting accounts because there were multiple men with that same name in the Boston area during the Revolutionary War. What we do know is that in the 1770s, Hall led a small group of free men of African descent to establish African Lodge No. 459 after having received their uh, Masonic degrees, which degrees are stages of membership that a man has to go through to become a, a full-fledged Freemason. Uh, they received these degrees from an Irish Freemason by the name of John Batt. Now, it's important to note that during this period, Freemasonry uh, in, the, in the American colonies, which would, would become the states, is seen as a very important social network for people to join. So we have people like George Washington, uh, Benjamin Franklin serves as a Grand Master in Pennsylvania at one point, Paul Revere, I mean, you, the list goes on and on and on. So the reason for these men of African descent to join in part was because in theory, the Masonic membership would put them not only in touch with movers and shakers in the white community, but also give them a sense of leadership in the African American community as well. Prince Hall quickly used the lodge uh, to promote social change, writing several petitions for abolition of slavery and advocating for a back to Africa agenda, as well as advocating especially for the education, excuse me, especially uh, advocating for the education of black children as well, even opening one of the first schools for black children in the state of Massachusetts out of his own home uh, in Boston. Okay. Um, following Hall's death, um, African lodges would eventually spread as, as the African-American community developed with the uh, development of America. And so you have African lodges appearing uh, at first in Philadelphia, then New York, my home state of New Jersey. Uh, you have lodges in uh, a Grand Lodge in Canada. When I use that term Grand Lodge, that's a, a state administrative body over the individual lodges in the various cities and towns. Um, and before the Civil War, you even have African, or as they would become to known, come to be known, Prince Hall Grand Lodges, uh, even appear as far away as California, Louisiana, in Washington, D.C., and even you have lodges in Tennessee and Kentucky before the Civil War. Why is that important? Because it's important to show that the free black community was establishing um, organizations and community even within territory that we would know as uh, a slave territory today, right? These, these are areas where slavery is still legal, but free blacks are organizing uh, they're organizing their lodges, they're organizing their churches, and this would be a whole separate conversation. However, if we were to dive into the development, especially of the AME church, uh, we would find uh, a real link between the establishment of lodges and churches 
among the free black community because there's a lot of the same people uh, uh, doing this uh, or organizing, okay? Um, we're not going to dwell on that right now. But however, if anyone would like to ask about it in the q and I'd be more than happy to, to discuss it then. So these lives are spread and spread and spread. And with them really helps the development of the black community because as Hall lays out as sort of a template, once you have the men in the community organized around um, education, economics, politics, okay, as well as spirituality, now you're able to build community even though you're sort of behind enemy lines in a way, especially for those who were in the, uh, in the slave south, okay? Um, this organization uh, continues to spread, of course, once the Civil War is over, uh, the formerly enslaved population of the Deep South uh, also begins to take part. And in fact, they join in droves um, over, the, over the course of the 19th century into the 20th. Uh, so that by the time you get to the Civil Rights Movement, Prince Hall Masonic membership was very common. And for those of you who are not members, I'm sure that you may remember having an uncle or a grandfather or a father or an older sibling or maybe even a spouse. Uh, who was a member of the Masonic Order, whether it be as a Mason for the men or the Order of the Eastern Star for the ladies, which we will talk about um, in a few moments, okay? Um, this organization has uh, a wealth of history, and I would encourage anybody who uh, is interested in learning more uh, to possibly con consider uh, picking up a copy of my book, um, which highlights the history of Prince Hall Masonry in the Wild West. And, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that in Q&A uh, as well, if you want to have any questions about that. So how did I get involved in this research? Um, what is my connection to this organization? Well, uh, I myself am a Prince Hall Freemason. Um, I joined uh, Corinthian Lodge number 18 uh, in 2010. Uh, which is located in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Um, and after serving in several positions, uh, I was elected as the Worshipful Master, uh, which is like being like the chapter president uh, of my lodge in 2015 uh, and re-elected in 2016 at the age of 25. And so the uh, the portrait that you see of me there uh, is, is, um, is, is me at the age of 25 in, in our Grand Lodge, every Worshipful Master it's an official portrait, <laughs> uh, and they put it on a nice little chart uh, so that when you walk in the lobby, everybody knows who's the, who are the uh, the masters of the individual lodges. And so this was this was my photo. Um, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to serve my lodge and the community um, in that way, and um, and it really helped me personally to um, elevate my leadership skills, organizing skills, um, my, my public oration. Um, a number of other things, conflict resolution, finance, I mean, just a whole lot of things that go into managing it in any organization, not just a Masonic one, but especially for those of you who are members of um, other fraternal organizations, you kind of have an understanding, parliamentary procedure. These are all important skill sets that really were not being taught to the African-American community in a formal way um, in terms of schools and universities and whatnot uh, pre-Civil War. But our, our ancestors had to learn. And they, and they did. They, they learned a lot of these things through Masonic lodges, through other fraternal organizations, uh, literary societies and whatnot. And they, in my view, they kind of serve as a training ground uh, for what becomes uh, the leaders during the Reconstruction period and those, those thereafter. Okay. Um, my personal interest in Freemasonry uh, has extended um, not just to the ancient rituals and teachings and all the mysterious stuff that, you know, a lot of folks, especially on the internet, would like to know about and and, and talk about, but I really dived into the history of Prince Hall Freemasonry, which is the African American branch. Uh, over the years, uh, the African lodges uh, and Grand Lodges chose to name themselves after Prince Hall, uh, who was kind of remembered as the patriarch of African American Freemasonry, if you will. Um, especially because I, I neglected to mention that after receiving Masonic membership, Prince Hall and those brothers received a charter. Uh, from the Grand Lodge of England, which is the oldest Grand Lodge in the world, to establish their first lodge. So having that lineage back to the original African lodge is important uh, within the Masonic world, within the Black Masonic world. Um, and it also, in a way, kind of informs a, so a, a sort of social genealogy, if you will, um, or an organizational genealogy. So every Prince Hall Mason 
uh, if, you, if a man says he's a prince or mason, he should be able to tell you what lodge he's from, where that grand lodge is, and how they descend back, you know, go, uh, going back and back all the way to that original African lodge, okay? Uh, not to dwell on that, um, in 2014, I was appointed as the uh, assistant grand historian, uh, and then in 2019, I became the grand historian of Washington, D.C., which is a post that I continue to hold uh, to this very day. And I'm, again, honored and privileged to be able to say that. Um, while I didn't necessarily jo join Freemasonry because of any sort of family tie, I unwittingly was contributing to a family legacy that began many years before my birth. Um, I, I'm almost embarrassed a little bit to say that how, how woefully ignorant I was of how important Freemasonry had been in my family background, but I'm thankful in that uh, I had the um, the curiosity to to try to learn and, and find out. Uh, maybe I'm just that much of a geek for things I'm interested in, uh, but I'll let you all be the judges. <laughs> so moving on. So this is a photograph that is very, very important to me. Uh, it was taken um, in July, late July of 2014. Uh, and it's a photo with um, the man in blue is my maternal grandfather, Gary Griffin. And the man in the yellow is actually my great grandfather, uh, Wallace L. Smith Jr. Uh, this photo is very important to me because on this particular day, uh, I had the pleasure of sitting down and interviewing my great grandfather uh, which is something a lot of folks don't get to do, especially in their 20s and whatnot, but I, I, I was able to do that. And in talking to him about his life, he was an educator uh, himself and whatnot. And uh, I asked him about his family background, uh, his, you know, his relationship with my great-grandmother and whatnot. Um, one of the questions that I asked him was about uh, his fraternal affiliations. Uh, both of these men um, are members of um, of Alpha Phi Alpha uh, fraternity, um, uh, which I'm, I'm not a member, but but I have a lot of alphas uh, in my family as well, uh, including my younger brother. Um, I asked him about his membership in the Elks, uh, which is another you know whole another history that that really needs to be dived into uh, at some point, as far as that organization is concerned. And of course, I made sure to ask about uh, his membership in Freemasonry. Um, all three of us actually um, are uh, Prince Hall Masons. Um, and my grandfather was a member of um, Fellowship Lodge 439 in Alabama. And my great grandfather uh, was a member of Zion Fountain Lodge number 54 in the city of Dothan, which is where that, that this photo was taken. Um, that lodge uh, no longer exists. However, it was the first Prince Hall Lodge in the city of Dothan. And when I asked my great grandfather about how he got involved, uh, he said, well, my father got me in there. And he explained to me that back at that, in, the, in that time period, uh, we're going back now to the 50s, um, that being an up and coming professional, uh, being a member of certain lodges and certain organizations was very important for networking and to get you to know who the leaders were in the community and what have you. Um, I, I would find out on this day that um, not only was his father involved, but so was his father-in-law. Both of his, his mother and father-in-law were were, were connected to the Masonic order um, as well. And, and on, I, I had no idea when I woke up that morning that I would discover that my great, great grandparents on several sides were, were, were members of the same organization that I, that I was a part of. And I, I neglected to include the um, some photos from the uh, family cemetery um, uh, in this presentation in the interest of time. Um, however, um, later on this, on this particular day, I did go and visit the family cemetery and actually get to see headstones with Masonic um, emblems on them from my ancestors, which was very, very important to me. Um, one other thing that I would just kind of note, especially for our, our newer genealogists around here, is that um, this day um, that I did this interview was actually seven days to the day before my great grandfather would pass from COVID-19 infection. Um, and so if you have those ancestors, um, those those parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins out there who are up in age, please do not take them for granted. Please make sure you get to write their stories down. Uh, I actually videotaped my great grandfather uh, on this day. And um, you, you just, there's just so much knowledge that when they go, that goes with them. And, and, and um, I would encourage you all 
uh, to please make sure that you do that. I'm so glad that I that I sat down with, with him and, and did that on this particular day. So on this particular family line, uh, we actually trace back. Now, I'm a Morgan. I have my father's last name. Um, this is my, my maternal side. Um, my grandfather, he took the name of the last name of Griffin because uh, he was actually raised by his own grandparents on the Griffin side. Uh, my great grandfather here is actually a step a step great grandfather, but you know we we don't distinguish in our family between the two. Uh, but in talking with my, with my grandfather about the family lineage going back and back and back, he, he he told me about one particular family line that I descended from, which I just always thought that the name was really interesting. Some of you may have the name in your own families, I don't know, but uh, he told me that we came from a guy named Joe McBride, and. I was like McBride. I had never heard the name before. I just always thought it was kind of interesting. And so I really wanted to dive into, you know, where was this family from? Who were these individuals? And, uh, and that's what we're going to get into talking about right now. So in the essence of time, I won't, I'll spare you all the details. However, uh, the McBride family lineage, as far back as I can take it so far, uh, actually starts with a couple known as Henry McBride and Mary Cade. Uh, Henry McBride, uh, maybe a little too small for you to see here on the slide, but Henry McBride was born uh, in the 1830s. Uh, the 1870 census actually states that he said that he was born in the state of Maryland, which is where I live now. Uh, and uh, the other census that he appears in the 1880, uh, 1900, and I believe 1910 um, actually states that he was born in South Carolina. Either way, uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, his wife Mary Cade, um, she actually was born in Georgia, according to the census records, uh, and they had several children together. Um, and you can see them here on this chart: uh, Frank, Jack, Joseph, who was the, uh, the the primary topic of our discussion today, um, Harry, Prince, Emma, and John Henry McBride. That you see there. Spouses, the ones who I've located thus far. Um, today, we're going to focus on Joe McBride. Um, however, I do want to just take a quick detour to give you an understanding about how civil and civic engagement has been a part of my family lineage going back all the way to the beginnings of the years of freedom, as, as they were called. So here we see from the Troy Messenger, uh, October 29th, 1874. This is just a short clipping uh, concerning um, the the um, organizing for the election that was going on in that particular year. Um, and you can see here uh, where it says Spring Hill beat number four. So we're now in Spring Hill, Alabama, which is an unincorporated community uh, next to right there where, where Tro Troy, Alabama is. Um, you see the name of, uh, of Henry McBride uh, and colored. And you also see the name of Frank Ross colored. Frank Ross is actually another direct ancestor of mine on a slightly different divergent branch, but they, but they, both of those men uh, actually were direct ancestors of myself, which is really cool to see them together on one document doing this, this kind of political work. Um, and you can see the article states that the above inspectors and returning officers are requested to have a copy of the Acts of the General Assembly of Alabama of 1872 and 1873 present at the voting precinct. Um, and it goes on from there. Um, but it's very important uh, in my view, that we that we show this because it's showing that um, even though we know that um, engaging in the vote, engaging in politics and whatnot was not always easy for Black people, that our ancestors still did it. And specifically today, we're talking about my ancestors, but I'm sure that some of yours, many of yours, uh, did so as well to varying degrees, and many times at the at the risk of their own lives. In fact, uh, this is a whole other presentation, but many of them lost their lives just trying to express their political voice. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I gave honor to that as kind of a prelude, if you will, to the story that we're gonna talk about with, Hen with Henry's son, Joseph, um, in a moment. Um, another interesting thing about Henry McBride was that uh, he, according to this article, which is again, it's from the Troy Messenger uh, in February of 1911, it states uh, that he had passed the century mark. Uh, Quote, a coffin was sold here yesterday for a Negro over 100 years old, said Adolphus Chansey today. The Negro is one of the old antebellum darkies, as was gen as, and was generally known about Spring Hill. His name was Henry McBride. No one seems to have known exactly how old he was, but for some time it has been conceded that he had passed the century mark. 
Now, according to my research, Henry McBride was actually probably in his 80s. Um, and there's, a whole again, a whole other discussion about this idea of um, very, very, very old, obscenely old black people and fetishizing that and whatnot. And again, that's a whole other discussion. But I did want to note that Henry McBride's death was actually noted in the newspaper um, because of his age and also because of how uh, active he was in the community um, in, in and around Troy at the time. Now, moving on, let's talk about my connection to Joseph, because that's who, who our, our discussion is about today. I know our time is limited. Um, as, as you can see from this chart, uh, Joseph and Jane McBride are actually my four times great grandparents. Uh, from, through my mother, Deborah, her father, Gary, who you saw in the previous slide, uh, his mother, Lucille, um, her mother, Alma, her mother, Alberta, back to Joseph and Jane. Uh, so that so I am a direct descendant of these people, um, according to the census and everything else that I've found, DNA, what have you, this is a part of my roots, um, if you will. And when it comes to my Masonic membership, I've oftentimes called Joseph McBride uh, kind of my Kunta Kinte figure, if you will. And I think in a few minutes you'll understand why. So Joseph and Jane uh, were natives of the community of Troy, Alabama. Uh, Troy is known today... Uh, primarily for Troy State University, uh, which is there, which I actually have to thank uh, some of the archivists there, as well as in the local libraries in, in that area for helping me with my research. Um, I've never actually been to Troy in person, but I'm thankful I'm going to be going there next month. Ooh, I'm very excited about that. Um, one of the most famous, uh, probably the most famous person ever to come from Troy actually was Congressman John Lewis. Uh, that's what uh, Dr. King actually referred to him as the boy from Troy. Um, Congressman Lewis's um, he, Congressman Lewis has a brother who's actually uh, married to one of my distant cousins um, as well. And if, for those of you who may have seen his funeral uh, some time ago, there was a young man who was his great nephew that gave a really nice speech about him and his importance and how he would miss him. And it was all over the news at the time. Well, that young man was actually a distant cousin of mine as well, who is also descended from uh, the subjects of our presentation today. So I'm uh, very happy to know that our family has started off small from a little Little, little small southern city, but we've gone all over the place and, and done a lot of wonderful things. And I'm very glad to be connected to that. We even have an, a, a, an Olympian uh, in the family as well, uh, which is really, really cool. So this is my favorite photograph probably in the entire world. This is actually, you're looking at the faces of Joseph and Jane and several of their children. Okay, um, this photograph has been passed down in our family from generation to generation. Um, I've even found cousins on online via Ancestry and social media who themselves have their own version of this photo or a copy thereof. And it's really, really cool to know that um, I'm, I'm literally looking at the faces of, our, of my ancestors. Uh, Joseph McBride actually would have been born a few years prior to the Civil War, so he technically was very, very likely born enslaved um, in uh, the city of Troy. Um, according to my research, he was most likely enslaved by a man named Reverend William Julius McBride, who was prob probably the owner of, um, of his parents as well. Um, I don't have a smoking gun, but I have some, some, some um, substantial, some, some uh, subjective evidence that leads me to, to believe that. Okay, um, his wife Jane, Jane was actually uh, quite a bit younger than him. She was born in 1871, according to the census. So she actually would have been born free. Um, I, I'm still amazed when I look at them, uh, how how um, how many children they have, they even have adult children in this photo. And yet the two of them look barely old enough to have, you know, to, to be ha making babies themselves. So, so I'm hopeful that those genes have passed down so that uh, uh, as I age, I'll age gracefully, as they say. Um, if you look at the woman with the scratch mark over her on, I believe this is my left. Um, that is, if you can see my, if you can see my curse, I'm not sure. Um, but that is my great, great, great grandmother, Alberta, um, as well. And this is just a really remarkable photo. Um, in total, uh, Joseph and Jane had 13 children. Um, so not all of them are depicted here, but in total they had 13, which is, which is, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of black love, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, moving on. Um, Joseph and Jane were married in April of 1887. As I mentioned, they had 13 children in total. 
um, and they lived in the unincorporated community of Spring Hill uh, for years and years. Um, Spring Hill is, to my understanding, you know, a little small rural you know, farming community uh, at this time. And so why, why would a black farmer or black farmers or you know, uh, people engaged in other professions in these small rural towns, why would they be connected or in a presentation about some abolitionists from Boston in the 1700s? What is that connection, right? Um, why is Masonic membership so important to people during this time? Uh, this is a photograph uh, actually uh, in the center there, you see Grandmaster Henry C. Benford uh, surrounded by the Grand Lodge officers of what is today known as the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Alabama. Um, this is a very important network for black men and women to be a part of. It's interstate, okay, meaning that there are lodges, you know, even myself, I, I, I've been traveling quite a bit this year, and everywhere I go, I'm able to say, hey, where is the local Prince Hall Lodge? Let me find some guys. I don't know anybody, but because I'm a Mason, they'll accept me in a, in a way that they wouldn't accept a stranger, take me out, show me a good time, make business contacts, etc. cetera. Um, during the um, period of Jim Crow, um, or even during slavery, this is very important, not only just for safe, for, for contact, business contacts and other things, but for physical safety sometimes as well. Um, very oftentimes, you know, you have brothers trying to just pass through a town and someone says, oh, this strange Negro did something. Well, I, let me go find the brothers in Masonry and maybe they can help me get about the situation or what have you. Okay. Um, it also is a means of, uh, of advocate, of advocating in a group, uh, aspect for social and political change as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so this photograph was actually taken in 1903. Uh, we, uh, I will find out uh, later that the Joe McBride actually became a Mason at the end of this year here. Um, and so this is a very important kind of photograph representing what those brothers would have looked like, who the leaders were during that time period um, as well. And so we're very thankful to have uh, images such as this um, to contribute to our work. Um, these are two very important um, leaders in Alabama's um, Masonic history. Uh, you saw this is a better photo of Grandmaster Henry C. Benford. Uh, Grandmaster Benford was a newspaper publisher uh, down in in Alabama, and he led that Grand Lodge for that state for many years. Um, according to the 1904 uh, Grand Lodge proceedings, which are the official records of a Masonic organization, uh, Grandmaster Benford uh, authorized. Brother Peter T. Mitchell, who you see here uh, in this next photo, um, he authorized him to uh, establish a new lodge in the city of Troy. Peter T. Mitchell was already the master of Pilgrim Lodge Number 62, which was the first lodge in, in that city. Um, and because he um, was uh, uh, skilled enough um, in administration and ritual, um, when, when another group of men said, hey, we want to start a lodge, or maybe perhaps they were already members of Pilgrim Lodge and they wanted to break away and start a second lodge. We don't know for sure. But for whatever reason, Grandmaster Benford said, okay, I can't be there, but Brother Mitchell, you go ahead and put them to work, uh, and install their officers and whatnot. And if they are worthy after a certain time period, um, I'll give them a charter, which we know um, did occur. Um, I was very thankful to have those records um, act, uh, and be given access to that uh, by Alabama's grand historian, my counterpart, Dr. Ken Collins. Um, I was actually helping him to digitize um, their records for, for their, for their um, own archive in that state. And I, I will admit openly and publicly that um, I was moving a little slower than Dr. Collins would have liked. Um, because I actually have family roots in the state. And so I'm going through, about, whereas I'm supposed to be scanning records, I'm reading them and then scanning them, trying to find um, people. And I will admit, when I was going through this particular uh, set of records, I was actually um, looking for another ancestor of mine who I later found, but on this particular day, I did not find him. But as I was going through the records, I found this. Uh, this is another image of Joe, Joe McBride that I had somebody do. But, but if you look at this officer listing here uh, from the year 1911, you'll see very clearly uh, the names of the officers of Myrtle Lodge number 162 in Spring Hill. And who do we see listed as the treasurer? 
but none other than Joseph McBride. This really um, captured me because um, by this time I was on, I was working my way to become Worshipful Master of my Lodge and whatnot. Um, and to find out that my great, 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 great grandfather was a member of this organization, um, that he had mo most likely had been born in slavery with no promises of being connected to anybody's Masonic Lodge, let alone, you know, anything uh, else of social value outside of the profits from, from cotton um, and other labor. The fact that he's the treasurer of a lodge, that tells me several things. One, it tells me he's literate. Two, it tells me he's dealing with money and they're trusting him with dealing with the money. Um, and three, because I had access to other years of records um, over time, I would find out that he actually started out as the first secretary of the lodge well, when it was established uh, in 1904. Okay. The reason why I'm showing you the 1911 record is not just because of the fact that it was the first one that I found, but out of all the years of of uh, Granddaddy Joe's membership that I have um, a record for, this one is very special to me because if you look two names above his, you'll see the name of Toby Townsend, the third name on the list. Uh, Toby Townsend, who is the junior warden of the lodge, that's what the JW stands for, SW is for the senior warden. Um, Toby Townsend was Joe McBride's son-in-law and was in fact my three times great grandfather. So I have my three times great grandfather and my four times great grandfather on the same document showing that they were members of the same Masonic Lodge. Now Toby Townsend is someone who I don't have a ton of research on. I don't have a photograph of him or what have you, but I know certain things about him because I'm a Mason and I actually have, have been a junior warden in my lodge. He was junior warden in his lodge during his time. And so I know certain things that he would have been involved in, certain things he would have had to know. And I know that what it would have taken for those brothers to trust him, to elect him to that position, the same way they elected his father-in-law. Um, over time, I would learn that several of these other individuals actually were um, relatives by marriage, um, largely. Uh, many of them, in fact, had children and grandchildren who intermarried with the McBrides, again, in the Spring Hill community. Not not terribly huge. Um, and even more, and, and, uh, even with, especially with the, uh, the Youngblood family, in particular, uh, I found DNA connections and other things, and I, which lead me to believe that some of these men actually were related in and of themselves. And so, um, when you're looking at these type of records, sometimes what you're what you're doing is you're you're getting a list of names that you otherwise may not you may not see together. So these men may not all be on the census together, but we know that they chose to be together because they're members of the same lodge. We can't always assume that just because people are on the same census page that they knew each other or that they were even close. Even if you do know somebody, it doesn't mean you're friends or, rela or related per se. But when you see people in organizations like this, these are the people they chose to be around. These are their friends. These are their relatives. These are, they have other associations, business, even in business. Um, I don't believe I put it in this presentation. However, this lodge is established in 1904. Now, Joe and Jane got married in the 1880s. Come to find out, D. M. Simmons, Doc M. Simmons, who was the master of Myrtle Lodge at this time, he actually signed as a witness for Joe and Jane's wedding, actually for the marriage bond that that that, that Granddaddy Joe had to take out. So we know that there's a friendship or an association between Doc Simmons and Joe and Jane McBride that actually goes back 20 years before they even establish this Masonic Lodge which is, you know, uh, a connection. I don't know all the details of, but to even have those dots, to be able to connect them in that way, I think I think is very important. Um, and I'm, again, grateful for. Now, not to be left out, uh, let's talk about the ladies for a second. Uh, sometime after making this awesome discovery, I would be blessed uh, by my good friend, Sister Patrice Hill, who lives in Alabama, with a book which is a... a, a um, Centennial History of the Order of the Eastern Star in Alabama. It was kind of a, um, like a um, Centennial um, Special Edition uh, book that they did down there. And, and she gave me a copy of that. Um, as I was flipping through it, I came upon this information about Arnold Chapter number 340, uh, which is also, again, in Troy, as you can see. Um, this 
uh, page here, uh, I'll just read it to you real quickly, states that the charter for this chapter was granted in, in 1914, and it was organized by Sarah Arnold, Sister Janie McBride, and Brother Joe McBride. Now, I'm going to kind of backtrack a little bit on something I said just very briefly um, about the census. Just because someone's in a census together doesn't necessarily mean that they knew each other or they were friends, but sometimes it does. And uh, In fact, Sarah Arnold was actually a neighbor, like literally a next door neighbor of my McBride ancestors. And so they came together uh, for whatever reason to establish this chapter. And they decided to name the chapter Arnold chapter after her. Um, I haven't been able to figure out exactly why she was the first, uh, why it was named after her or why she, as you can see, if you go down, she actually serves as the first worthy matron of this chapter um, as well. Um, however, uh, that that's what they decided to do. And if you look over to the right, you'll see that Granddaddy Joe actually serves as, as the first worthy patron. So in the Eastern Star chapter, you have a female head and you have a male kind of representative head, which is the worthy patron. Um, Granddaddy Joe and Sarah Arnold serve together um, for whatever reason, and which is really, really, I think, awesome to, to find out that Granddaddy Joe was so involved in this organization, as was Grandma Jane. And, and so I think that in in continuing their legacy, if you will, uh, in my Masonic membership, I'm also kind of trying to honor them uh, personally. Now, this document is important also because there are other family members that I was able to locate on here. Uh, it's, um, most, some of them are highlighted and some are not, I will admit. Um, but if you look and you see the name of uh, Callie Carter, that's actually one of Joe and Jane's daughters, okay? Uh, you'll see the name of, um, of uh, Lonzo Jackson, that's actually a relative. It says Lano, but it's actually supposed to be Alonzo Jackson. Uh, he's actually a relative. Um, Leona Johnson, Leona McBride Johnson, that's actually one of Joe and Jane's other daughters. Lum Davenport, that's actually a son-in-law. Uh, that's a, a great uncle that my grandfather, that's someone my grandfather actually knew in life, okay? Um, and if I showed you the full page, there are even more uh, children of Joe and Jane, uh, especially the daughters that, that, that joined this particular Eastern Star chapter. And we do have some record that at least one or two of their sons joined the, the um, Myrtle Lodge um, as well and became Masons like their father. Okay. Now, to go a little deeper into um, some of the importance of finding out about your ancestors' fraternal um, ties, you'll find all type of events and um, and whatnot that they may have witnessed or even taken part in. Um, my great 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 grandparents were members of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Alabama, um, which you can see the seal for the for that Grand Lodge right here, um, and you know. I didn't always, when I go on newspapers.com and other archives, I don't always just look for my person. I'm also looking for what organizations, what churches, what lodges, what other things were they involved in? And can I find other activities that maybe they're not named in, but maybe they were a part of or they witnessed? So, for example, um, here you'll see that in 1908, um, it, according to the Detroit Messenger, the Negroes were building a, a new Masonic temple in that city. Okay, uh, so the contract had been um, set uh, by to W.E. Hanchi, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, by the Colored Masonic Lodge of Troy for the erecting of a Masonic temple for the Negroes. The building is to be erected on Academy Street, opposite of Charlie Brooks's home. It will be a frame two stories high and cost about $2,000. The Negroes will have a public hall in the same vicinity and a Pythian Lodge. So we're seeing the Knights of Pythias, okay? And we're seeing the um, Masonic Lodge. There, you know, these are, these black folks are building community. And I neglected to mention uh, earlier that Peter T. Mitchell, uh, who was the man who who, uh, who helped set up um, Myrtle Lodge, uh, Peter T. Mitchell was the Grand Master of the Pythian. So he's he's a member of the Masonic Order, but he's also the Grand Master of the Pythians, and you'll you'll see that kind of cross pollination quite a bit um, in um, Black fraternal history um, as well. So if you if you see someone's a member of one organization, you may want to check and see can I find them in something else as well, or are, are there connections? Um, and so this is uh, just one of the examples of what we're talking about. Now I know that this particular Masonic temple was not the one. 
that Granddaddy Joe likely would have attended um, because this would have been more in the downtown area of Troy. But Granddaddy Joe's Masonic Temple is also very important. Um, it wasn't documented in newspaper as far as I've seen, but it's also very important because the original lodge for Myrtle Lodge 162, the original building still stands, although it's no longer occupied. Um, as I mentioned, he served as the first secretary of this lodge. And um, I actually have um, several relatives, older relatives now, who can remember when this lodge was occupied. Um, the members actually now meet downtown at, at, uh, at the other building. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of an old country lodge. It's kind of just been sitting there. Uh, it's it's um, on land connected to the family church and the family cemetery, but the building still stands all these years later. And when I first got this photograph uh, from a local um, librarian who was nice enough to take a picture for me, um, the first thing that stuck out, if you can see uh, at the uh, towards the top there, you'll see the Masonic Square and Compass emblem still sits on that lodge building to this very day. That is, I mean, most people probably wouldn't care about something like this, but for me, uh, you know, when I go down to Alabama next month, um, it'll be my first time in Troy. Um, I can't wait to go there and see that building. You know, uh, I, I highly doubt there's anything that, I mean, there may, who knows, maybe there are some records or something in there that I want, but, but I, I don't know. But uh, just to be able to go there and, and, put, and put my hands on that wall and touch that door, you know, you know, maybe a little dirty. I might bring some hand sanitizer with me, but just to be able to, to, to stand there and take a picture um, in front of a building that my ancestor would have helped build. And, and actually we've handled the finances for, um, to know that it's still standing um, is, is you know, a testament. Um, this is not the same lodge, but I just wanted to kind of show that uh, what a lodge like that would have looked like in its heyday. Um, Prince Hall Lodges, Eastern Star Chapters, Odd Fellows Lodges, the um, Daughters of, uh, uh, Sisters of Mysterious Ten, Daughters of Isis, all these different groups were very important precursors to the modern civil rights movement. Uh, black people needed to find space that they controlled and operated in order to um, help the community to grow and prosper despite the oppression of racism uh, and um, legal segregation. And so the, these organizations, although today many would say they've fallen out of fashion, I would say there's still some lessons that we need to learn as a community from them, not only uh, from a political perspective, but also even from a genealogical one, especially in small towns, many times these people were interrelated. As a genealogist, when you get access to those type of records, or when you learn some of those uh, that someone may have been a member, you should try to find out, are there other relatives? And even if there aren't, what were the connections? Were they going to the same church? Were they members of the same study clubs? Were they going to school together? There, there are other connections oftentimes that you will find. Now, to kind of change gears just a little bit, uh, Gram Grandma Joe, or excuse me, Grandma Jane and Granddaddy Joe uh, were actually victims of the Spanish flu epidemic, um, and, or pandemic, as I should say, uh, which infected one third of the global population, killing 100 million people globally. Um, 675,000 of these were in the United States. And um, while African Americans were less likely to catch the disease, we were far more likely to die from it because of poor um, medical care. Uh, and so and oftentimes zero medical care that was being, being given to African Americans because of this myth of blacks being dirty and carriers of the disease or what have you. Um, and so unfortunately, Grandma Jane and Granddaddy Joe died um, within four or five days of each other from Spanish flu infection. Okay.
Now, we do have uh, estate records for Granddaddy Joe. Uh, he he didn't he was his, his home his farm was was still mortgaged at the time. Um, and one of the things that I th- found kind of interesting in uh, in reviewing his, his estate records was that if you look at the highlighted section, it says that he had a life insurance policy issued to him by the Standard Life Insurance Company of Atlanta, Georgia, for two thousand dollars. Okay. Now, for me, I, I try to be a bloodhound with the stuff, as I'm sure all of you are. Um, I want to know about Standard Life, and is, is there any policy slips or something that I can find? Is there any more information? Well, I had no idea. It would circle right back to my initial interest about fraternal uh, history in the black community. You see, Standard Life Insurance Company, which was established by Herman E. Perry, initially started out as the insurance arm of the Knights of Pythias, okay? Um, the Knights of Pythias and the Grand Knight Order of Our Fellows, the Prince Hall Masons, these organizations um, oftentimes offered insurance benefits to their members as an impetus to try to get people to join. Um, this is a, this is actually the um, the precursor to the modern insurance industry. The idea is that you join a, a, an organization and they already have doctors and people who are members who they've negotiated special rates for. And if you go somewhere else, you're going to probably get a higher price quote than if you stay within the network, right? You've heard this phrase before. For those anybody who deals with insurance for your families, you know about in-network, out-of-network, and whatnot. Well, that very concept goes right back to uh, fraternal organizations and benevolent societies. So the idea of putting money in a pot is growing being after being invested. And if something happens to you, you'll be taken care of, okay? Um, the history of early black life insurance uh, companies, as well as white ones as well, goes right back to the golden age of American fraternalism. And so is it possible that Granddaddy Joe may have not only been a Mason, but a member of the Odd Fellows or the Knights of Pythias? Very much so. I don't have a smoking gun, but the idea that he has a membership in uh, standard life insurance leads me to say, well, there's, there's a real possibility, especially because we know that he knew the Grand Master of the uh, Knights of Pythias in his particular state. It's very possible, um, but unfortunately those records have not surfaced. What has surfaced is this newspaper article here, uh, which actually states that Professor G.F. Oliver of Union Springs, Alabama, was here on Monday to pay a $2,000 claim to the McBride family for the death of Mr. Joe McBride. Mr. Oliver is one of the representatives of Standard Life Insurance Company of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, so we know that policy was paid out. And again, you have to think about it. Joe is dead. Jane is deceased. You know, mom and dad are gone. My direct ancestor, Alberta, and her older sister, um, on, on era, had to come together to help raise their younger siblings along with their their spouses and what have you. Um, and that is actually documented here. I won't read this entire thing to you, but these are actually um, legal emancipation documents for some of the younger children of Joe and Jane. Um, their um, in-law, their, their, their male um, relatives, meaning their brothers and their brother-in-laws actually petitioned the court on their behalf to say, yeah, well, there may be 15 or 16, but they're able to enter into contracts to work and that they would not become a burden upon the state and that the male members of the family were coming together to assure, to ensure that they didn't become vagrants um, and whatnot. Um, situations like these, oftentimes the Masonic uh, Lodge members often would have came together and put, you know, mo- put some monies together to give to those children and then take care of the orf- of them as they wouldn't be known, they would be known as orphans of the Lodge, right? So I wanted to also show that as well, that although we don't have evidence directly that the Masonic brothers assisted, um, this is a kind of situation where membership in an organization like this would have been crucial to a family, especially a family of children who just lost both mother and father. Um, You know, it would have been crucial during that period. Um, Today, Grandma Joe and Granddaddy Jane are still together. Uh, They're buried at the Elam Missionary Baptist Church uh, there in Spring Hill, they're buried side by side um, on land that used to be owned by our family. Um, the lodge, the cemetery, and the church are all on the same land. And so I'm thankful that when I go down there to visit with them, 
uh, that I'll be able to kind of kill three birds at one time just by visiting this one particular uh, site. Um, and so um, with that being said, um, I, I, this presentation is, is in honor of their memory and of the family that they planned the seed for. And it's my hope that through the work that I do that my ancestors see that the seed has grown a, bounty, a bountiful fruit uh, indeed. Uh, if anyone is interested uh, to learn more uh, about the history of Black Freemasonry, I do have a book out. Uh, the title is The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867 to 1906. Uh, it can be purchased from, from my website, jamesrmorgan.com. You can also get a signed copy if you would like. And uh, with that being said, I look forward to hearing your questions uh, during the Q&A period. Thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank the sons and daughters of United States Middle Passage for having me this year. Take care.